so I, I promise, so actually I just need to tell you a confession, I'm not using the S word as often as she used over there. <laughs> um, I may have some other words, but I try not to swear as much because I, I see a lot of strange things and you will see stuff that I am going to present on, on, on bad applications, on poorly performing applications, on crappy applications, maybe I use the C word more often. Um, I know we only have 30 minutes and have a lot of content to go through. I hope you can see the screen. So today I'm talking about implementing metrics-driven DevOps. Um, and I'm actually the guy there on the picture. And if you can see what I'm actually wearing, it would give you an indication of where I'm actually from, which would also give an indication where this weird accent comes from. Does anyone want to take a guess? Huh? Wales. Wales, nah. <laughs> so we call them lederhosen. So they are leather pants, and I'm from Austria, so the sound of music, right, all that stuff. Nobody knows the sound of music in Austria because it's just an export, really, seriously. <laughs> I've, only, I've only seen it last year for the first time because a friend of mine has been bugging me so long. He said, you need to look at the sound of music, it's so awesome. <laughs> and uh, all right, so let's get into it. Um, this is how I prepared for DevOps days, all right? <laughs> Actually, I got a tweet. Where is the lady who tweeted me? Is she in here? Maybe not. She said she's joining me. She, t she said, what are you going to talk about? And I tweeted, I was in Croatia uh, enjoying some local craft beer. It was like three weeks ago. I did a trip through Europe with my girlfriend and great beer. And then I gave it some thoughts on, on what I want to talk about. So I'm, 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 as you can see, I was really relaxed. Uh, I spent a lot of my time looking at metrics, and I'm sure you guys are doing it too, right? Who is doing operations monitoring? Who looks at metrics every day? Yeah. So, and I talked about metrics yesterday at the bar, and I promised I'm actually also adding some of the screens, uh, some of the pictures I took yesterday. So I, 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 I is, he, is he in the room? Here he is, here we go. Yeah, we talked about metrics, um, and we talked about uh, Data Robot, the company that you work for, right? You could maybe use some of the metrics that I'm showing you today. Uh, then I also said I'm doing a shout out to this gentleman. He's probably not in the room, or is he? Because he should be in the other room because he's doing the session after me. Um, IT ops at Zipcar. And I thought I'd just spice it up a little bit. But I'm going to talk about DevOps, and I'm talking about metrics. And uh, obviously, I represent the company. You can read it on my shirt. I work for a company. We do monitoring, but in the end, what I'm going to show you is general concepts, and you can use whatever tool you want whether it's your Relic App, Dynamics, Datadog, we have so many companies out there that do a great job in giving you metrics, all right? Um, I love metrics, and I believe metrics should be put in your face. This is what you will see if you actually walk into the development office in Linz, Austria, of Dynatrace. We call this the pipeline state UFO. What this actually tells me as a developer, if I check in code and I click on the commit button, and then I walk over to the coffee machine. These are UFOs that are hanging around in the office, and they are hooked up with Jenkins. So if I break the build while I was walking over to the coffee machine and it goes from green to red, I know I just messed up. <laughs> yeah. By the way, this is also on GitHub. So if you have a 3D printer, you can print it out with instructions on how to get the LEDs in and the REST API. So you can, it's, it's very cool. It's, it's data in your face. So not only do we hook this up with our, our build servers, but um, if you look at a production environment, uh, this, I hope this is the, the, the least type of monitoring everybody has. It's availability monitoring. This is a, an example from Kia.com, the car manufacturer, last year at the Super Bowl. So last year at the Super Bowl, when they did the deployment of the optimized Super Bowl website, their website crashed. Right? This is obviously something, hopefully, where everything goes into red mode. Uh, but this is the, the basic level of monitoring, availability. Another example is user experience. I think a lot of people, a lot of companies talk about user experience. I know it's a little hard to see maybe, but what we always do, we are uh, categorizing end user performance by monitoring end user performance from the mobile device or the browser. And we categorize them in happy users, medium happy users, and frustrated users. And this is actually an example from a SaaS-based company, and what they are doing, and it's hard to see, but May 1st, they started a new marketing campaign, and what these guys also do, so they try to get people on their SaaS system, so sending out a lot of emails, and twice a day to do a deployment, at midnight and at noon. And looking at these numbers, so green means the number of happy users, obviously the marketing campaign worked pretty well. Great proof, it worked. 
over the first three days. What you could also see, the more people were on the system, also the number of unhappy users grew. We figured out related to performance. The more people on the system, the slower the thing got, and also the longer the campaign ran, they didn't attract the right people anymore. So at some point in time, the marketing team can say, we're not attracting the right people anymore. What also happened on day two, they made a deployment at noon where they tried to fix a jQuery bug. Unfortunately, they fixed it in a way that nobody that was using Internet Explorer could log on anymore, which immediately caused a drop in conversion rate. Okay, so these are all metrics, I believe, that you should have, and if these metrics go in the wrong direction, then remember the red UFO thing? It should go into red mode. Another thing that I am uh, also always, I mean, we, I talk a lot about performance, and we talk, when we talk about performance, it's about speed, but I think another big thing is if you deploy a new app version into production and everything is super smooth, nobody complains, but if memory usage goes up by 40%, and then garbage collection, if it's a Java, or .NET, or whatever runtime system, goes up 4x because of garbage collection, this is also a bad deployment, right? Because basically your cost that you have to pay to Amazon or where whoever runs your infrastructure is going up like crazy. This happened because of an update of a third-party dependency injection library. It had nothing to do with any code change. They updated a dependency injection library with a memory leak. And that was not good, obviously. Um, another thing that I often do is uh, when we do load testing, we do a lot of load testing with clients that are preparing for, uh, for uh, the whole shopping holiday season, right? So, we are, we are trying to figure out how does the system scale under regular load. So what you can see here is I think it's 10, 10 containers for regular load. And then in this case, we tested it with double the load, and double the load meant we needed 48 containers to support that SLA. This is not a perfectly scaling system, obviously. And it means the more users we have on the system, the more expensive it gets. Last example that I have in this area, um, I think yesterday I was at the Wayfair uh, studio up there and they showed some really cool stuff what they do with uh, visualizing where people are buying from and stuff like that. What we actually do with end user data, we look at click heat maps and we compare it with performance and user experience. So I'm responsible for our community. It runs Confluence, by the way, the guys from Atlassian, big shout out, great tool. So we have 150,000 users on that Confluence instance and we are providing documentation and tutorials and all that stuff. What I do, I'm trying to figure out where do people click to if they're happy, and how does it change if they become less happy and frustrated. I'm actually using this to prove that we need to make sure that Confluence is fast, because if it's not fast, people start, stop using content and click on this link here, which is opening up a support ticket. Okay, this is the immediate proof that performance impacts the behavior, and in our case, we need more support people. Another thing what I can do with this, figuring out which features are used by which users and which features are not used, so I can figure out what to optimize in the next sprint, and maybe which features to kick out. Make sense? All right. All right, so some, some examples. I hope, I guess I don't need to explain to you what DevOps is all about and continuous delivery, and the Phoenix project, I just always put this in in case there are some newbies or DevOps virgins in the room, because if you could escape this, this literature, then I'm not sure how you did it. Um, or why you made it to the conference. But um, obviously we know that these, these books, they inspired a lot of people, and uh, I think initially all the unicorns came on stage and they talked, like Facebook and Etsy and Amazon, they, they talked about their stories. I think now we have some other stories too, which we also hear at conferences. Target is a great example. They were talking about this at the DevOps days and velocity, also how they transform the way they develop and deploy software, right? They went from monthly to 80 deployments per week and immediately saw a drop in incidents. Big success rate. Another company that has been in the news a lot is, is Capital One. I notice a lot of text on here. The critical thing here is they are open sourcing the DevOps dashboards. The project is called Hygia, basically visualizing their pipeline and where, how long it takes for a build to move into the different stages. And what they basically figured out, they need to shift, especially performance tests left, they need to shift quality left in order to be faster with deploying. They're automating the shit out of it on new stack. Their CEO actually said they're moving all of their critical apps into Amazon now, which is, I think, one of the first banks that is doing that move, and I think a lot of will follow. Um, also, we as Dynatrace, in case you know us, we started 10 years ago. We had an enterprise product that people had to download and install. We went from two major releases per year also to 26 major releases, so we also made it an interesting transition. That's also, I believe, 
we can talk to people and help them going through that transition. Uh, it's not only about obviously delivering fast, but also delivering something that is fast, now referencing some of the companies that are out there that say response time is obviously critical. How many of you are not working in e-commerce? Okay, most of you. All of these companies, I mean, we always hear these numbers about e-commerce, and then most of the people not working in e-commerce. Still, performance is important. Remember my example from before with the Confluence community? If Confluence is slow, people are not, be, are not able to, to use the content or consume the content. They become less productive. So performance is critical, not only for e-commerce. Now, we got a lot of stories, right? Um, however, I think a lot of people still fail in the transition. And I guess that's also why you guys are here, because you want to learn from others. I believe and one of the reasons why companies do fail is because most companies are not unicorn companies. Most companies are not startups. They are well-established big companies. And then just mimicking and copying what the unicorns are doing typically doesn't cut it. That's kind of my point here. What I see as the major mistakes, it's just believing you can just automate everything and push it on a new stack through a pipeline. Basically, what, end, what you end up is having a crappy pipeline and you just automate everything, right? Because if you already have bad quality code and not good code practices, then just automating it will just cause more problems, just faster. Also, I believe that a lot of people thought if we go to a more rapid deployment model, we can faster react on new feature requests. And that's true. But the thing is, if we keep just adding and adding and adding, and never look at which features are actually used and which features are not used, then you end up with a big pile of, of technical debt or business debt. That's what I call it. Remember my community example? If I keep putting on new documentation, new documentation, I just keep maintaining a lot of stuff. But if I never look at what is actually used and what is not used, I keep maintaining stuff that nobody needs. Same is true with every software feature. If you look at Microsoft Word, if 10 years ago they would have known which features are not used or not used by 99% of the people, and would, if they would have got rid of it, it would have been easier for them to migrate to the cloud and to other platforms. But I think they dragged a lot of stuff with them if, without knowing what is used and what is not used. Okay? So I love learning from others. I already gave you some examples. Um, I have a program, and, and I, so I do a lot of community work and, and meetups and all that stuff. I allow people to share their performance data with me so that I can learn, and I also give them my recommendation. So I call it Share Pure Path because Pure Path is our kind of data set that we collect. And I want to give you one example, I believe, that hits hopefully down the point what I mean with metrics driven DevOps. This is an example of a Swedish company, and uh, what they provide, actually, I'm pointing at you now. So the two of us, we were, we were in Sweden in the early 2000s, sitting at a bar and said, you know what's missing in Sweden? If we want to send our kids to pick up soccer, or football, as they call it over there, um, then there's no easy way to figure out where are the football clubs, when do they have the testing exercise times and so on. So we said, we built a website where sports clubs can register and people can then go to our website and the first thing they see is a Google-like like a Google -like search bar, search for football clubs in Stockholm and they get a list, awesome. We started the project over the years, limited success. In early 2015, we said we either kill it or we start expanding because otherwise it's a waste of time. We started expansion and basically saw the classical hockey stick phenomenon. So more people started to come on board, but then we also saw response time going through the roof. And basically we were fearing we we're losing users, right? Very common scenario. I mean, a lot of talks here are about scaling. This system didn't scale. What was interesting is when we looked at the data, so what you see here is what we call an, a transaction flow, New Relic, AppDynamics, all the other tools have probably a similar term. term. We analyzed what happened at the number one use case in our, of our cool app. This is a search for football clubs in Stockholm, which returned 33 elements, actually, 33 football clubs. It's amazing. In April, the response time was 0.52 seconds. In May, a month later, once we went through the hockey stick, it was 2.6 seconds. What we also noticed, our system was totally maxing out CPU, and because we built it 10 years ago with no clue about architecture and scalability, we basically were caught in that monolith. What did we do? What did we do? What do you think? We talked with him, because we, <laughs> we didn't do anything anymore, so we asked him, please fix the situation. 
So you had to take over our old crappy code, and you said, guys, if we want to fix this, exactly, we're drinking too much. <laughs> if you want to fix this, then here's my proposal. We rip up the, the monolith into a front end that we can potentially put into AWS, because you want to go global as well. We want it to expand to the US. And the back end is uh, the search service that we can scale up and down in our local data center that we still have in Stockholm, right? Cool. Here's what happened. You made the transition. What's your name, by the way? Patrick. Patrick. Patrick, you gave us the go. On the go live date in the morning, everything was green. People in Europe were happy because nobody was up yet. Euro, they, they, were, <laughs> they were also kind of going to bed. Australians, we didn't care about them because they don't play football. They do some other crazy stuff down there. <laughs> so 7 o'clock in the morning, and then the real traffic came in. And at noon, we had the following scenario. 25 seconds response time for the search, 60% bounce rate, everybody was unhappy. Patrick? I was cheap. You were, that's true. He was cheap. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the question is, what went wrong? What went wrong is, and this is a thing that I see in a lot of migration projects. So what we actually did is we looked at the number one search query, again, football clubs in Stockholm. We actually extracted the data, and then I'm looking at metrics. First of all, I saw it super slow. We already know that. I also look at the bytes transferred, so five kilobyte of payload for a search result page of 33 is okay, I would say. But Patrick, here's a strange thing. You said this is a front-end server that we can deploy to Amazon East, West. This is the new back-end service. Why on earth do we have a direct database connection from the front-end Amazon service to the back-end database in Stockholm? Very Not very good, yeah. So basically, actually, we too messed up in the early days. What we actually did when we built the monolith, in the very beginning of the search feature, we had a SQL query saying, give me the primary keys of all the sports clubs that meet that search criteria. A list of 33 came back in the monolith with a local loop. And then basically, we were n plus 1 query to the database, give me the details for the first, second, and third. This code was still in there, but the local loop is now a call to a new microservice. That means we have 33 microservice calls, one for each search result, transferring three kilobyte per call, 99 kilobyte each. That's 99 kilobytes we need to pay for Amazon for every time somebody searches for football clubs. And in the end, 171 SQL calls, because the M plus one query problem we had already in there, now multiplied, okay? And what I don't understand is, Patrick, why you never tested the end-to-end -end use case, why you actually never asked us what are the top five search queries, and then you could have executed the search queries, and you could have figured out that this is a data-driven problem. The more search results, the more calls, so this is data-driven, all right? So, Patrick, good news. You fixed the problem after we totally crashed and got into the news. <laughs> but you fixed the problem, so you fixed it. One call comes in in the front, one goes to the back, three database call, everybody's happy. The aha moment that we all had, obviously, was why didn't we look at these metrics earlier? Why didn't we look at these metrics on your local machine already and throughout CI and CD? So here is now my scenario where I believe this is where you guys need to invest. If we could now go back, this is a very simplified Excel-type style version of a pipeline. We, too, hopefully, in the beginning, we had two tests, the search for our search, and also a cool second feature I was not telling you about is a news alert. So if we don't find the stuff, we can enter our email. So we have the test, whether it's a Selenium or whatever we used back then. Green means awesome. You know, everything is functionally right. When you took over the job, what you should have asked for, when you execute these tests, please tell me what's going on in the code base already. You could have already spotted that for a single search, we have 35 SQL calls. You could have already spotted the M plus one query problem without going through all of the code, all right? Well, obviously, we didn't do that, so we deployed it into production, and what we see in production, and this is something that I, this is why I like the metrics across the life cycle, we can see how many users are actually using a feature, and what's the peak response time. So what we could actually spot, is obviously, it was very slow, the search, 5.2 seconds, 63% were using it, that's not good, because it's the number one feature. And also, what was interesting, the news alert feature was only used by 0.5% of our users. Very low. But this data gives us the option to say, you need to 
do something. You need to fix performance and do the architectural changes. So that's basically what you did. And after you remember, you do your code changes, you commit, then you walk over to the coffee machine, you run your tests. Functionally, you didn't break anything. But all of a sudden, these metrics tell you immediately that something in the code has significantly changed, that you now have 34 API calls, one that comes in in the front, 33 back and forth, SQL calls, 20 times as many bytes over the wire, three times as much CPU, it's a lot of costs. If you have this data in your pipeline, we all make the decision that we're not going to deploy this. The little thing across above the, the coffee machine goes red. Instead, what we do, you fix it, we run the tests again, everything looks much better now. This is immediate feedback. Within minutes, you get feedback. Now we have two API calls, one that comes in in the front, one that goes to the back. We deploy it, and now we see if it actually had a positive impact. We can actually see search is up 75%, but because we have a scaling architecture, we now have five Amazon instances that run the whole thing. But guess what? Even though we improved performance of search, it had hardly any impact on the users. So maybe this is one of the features that nobody cares about. The same as with Microsoft Word. This is a feature that later down the road, we can just get rid of. And this is the power of having metrics not only in production to do firefighting and, and, and fixing uh, bad deployments, but across the life cycle and feeding it back. Does this make sense? Okay. So I assume you guys already have some type of testing, right? Who, is, who runs tests on a build, commit to commit, commit to commit basis? Awesome. If you have these tests, why don't you just hook it up with your tool of choice, whatever it is, and let this tool of choice for every test extract these numbers. Number of SQL statements, number of threads involved, bytes sent, and then baseline these numbers across every build. And then, if you have something like this where Patrick makes a code change and now a number jumps up like crazy, you detect a regression based on an architectural metric or a performance metric, then you fail the build. Okay? You already have made the investment of your tests. There's a lot of tool vendors out there that give you the tools for the metrics or we do this as well and then just fail the build. And with this, I believe we can remember the crappy pipeline we had in the beginning. I think we can build a nice pipeline. We can build a pipeline where developers check in better code from the beginning by looking at these metrics. We can stop bad builds early in CI. We can do more performance testing, and then we can feedback the usage of features from production back. And in the end, we are all performance heroes because our software can run 24-7 with awesome performance, except the Australians, because we just don't care about them. <laughs> Are there any Australians in the room? <laughs> okay. So I hope this makes sense. Now, I have uh, this example and many more examples uh, on SlideShare. So I uploaded this presentation already to SlideShare if you haven't seen my tweet. Uh, if you want to look at our tools, we also have them available. I'm actually running the free program, so that everything I showed you today is actually totally free for developers, testers, and architects. I have a YouTube channel where I show how I do things. I also have a podcast in case you are interested in, in listening to me talking about performance, and I guess you know what to do with a mail address. And Twitter. You can follow me but not stalk me. <laughs> All right, how are we doing on time? Four minutes. Okay. Does this make sense? Okay. Pick a single metric and try to automate it across your pipeline. The number one pattern that I always find are around database access, whether it's a relational database, whether it's anything that has to do with database access, the number one problems. Then it comes to caching, memory management, and all that stuff. All right, so metrics, 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 thank you. <laughs>